So I'm sitting in Islamabad, I'm looking at the news. The Pakistani rupee is in free fall against the US dollar. There's political gridlock in the Punjab after the by-election results. There's negotiations between the Pakistani state and the TTP, sometimes called the Pakistani Taliban in Kabul. There's regional talks on Afghanistan going on in Tashkent. There's new outreach between uh, the Biden administration and Pakistani officials. And I'm thinking, why don't we have a podcast that can cut through all this complexity? And we do. It's called The Audit. It's a new podcast related to U.S.-Pakistan relations. And we're going to be getting out of the tired tropes that dominated this discussion and instead focusing on decision makers, people who are in the room where those decisions were made, and people with real skin in the game. For the first episode, we're going to talk about bilateral economic relations. So in other words, money. And we're joined by Harun Sharif, who advised the last government on investment into the country. Musadik Zirkanai, who founded Pakistan's largest textile mill. Kalsum Lakhani, who's helping Pakistani startups transition into large enterprises through her venture capital firm. Adam Tooze, who's a world-renowned historian and economist. And if you're wondering who I am, my name is Adam Weinstein. I'm going to be your host and guide through these episodes. I'm a researcher at the Quincy Institute. I'm a non-resident fellow at Tabad Lab. And in every episode, I'm going to also be joined by one of my Tabad Lab colleagues. And today we have Maryam Mirza. Hi, Adam. I'm really glad to be here and really glad to be part of this refreshing conversation about money. I feel like it's such an important part of the relationship. The U.S. has been giving Pakistan about $1 billion in humanitarian response. And I think for civilian assistance, that number is somewhere close to $5 billion. And this has been the case since 2009. Clearly, we know that the U.S. does have its own strategic interests, and so 70% of all these figures are going for more security-related reasons, and maybe 30% for more economic-related needs. And so this really begs the question and really makes me wonder, what is the context that we so often miss here when we're trying to understand the money relationship between U.S. and Pakistan? Yeah, so before we even get to talking about trade or even aid, it feels important to understand the unique position that America holds, or at least professes to hold, in the global economic landscape. America is is a major donor, as a as an, a provider of aid. It's a major supplier of military equipment. Uh, it is a major tech player, uh, but it is the private sector above all that matters for America's financial influence in the world. And in that space, of course, it is it is very very powerful. And and so, yes, using indirectly the mechanisms of dollar diplomacy do, does provide America with some real leverage. That was the voice of Adam Tooze, and he's a professor of history and the director of the European Institute at Columbia University. I sat down with him to get a sense of U.S. influence in the global financial system so that we can then understand how this manifests into economic ties between the U.S. and Pakistan. Pakistan's finance minister just announced that a Chinese consortium of banks signed a RMB uh, $15 billion deal, so that's roughly $2.3 billion US dollars, uh, a loan facility agreement with Pakistan. And you've written, were there actually an active comp- competition for influence in the world economy right now between China and the West? Debtor countries might hope to play the sides against each other, but China is re- retrenching its foreign lending and there is little appetite for public commitments from the West. The problem is not competition for influence, but the fact that there is a vacuum where a global financial order ought to be. What do you mean by that? Well, um, the point was being made in the context of um, extended conversations about the future of the current global currency system and the central role of the dollar. And um, there's a lot of debate there about potential competition between a Chinese-backed system and the existing American system. And um, I find those conversations really rather unhelpful in understanding the present world situation because they're premised on the assumption that there is a clearly articulated dollar-based system, um, which is true for the rich countries of the world where we have a central bank-centered model of liquidity provision that runs through swap lines. But as soon as you move out from that central core system, um, you know, the real hub of the dollar system, the, um, the phrase and becomes much less coherent. Um, and Pakistan is a case in point, right? It's clearly a, 
an absolutely strategic um, player in 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 the region. Um, and yet policy towards Pakistan, I think, in economic and financial terms is made in an incredibly ad hoc basis. I mean, that's dictated in part by problems on the Pakistani side, but, but America too, you'd be hard pressed to, as it were, spell out what their strategy is. Um, there's a lot of talk about the need to counter the One Belt, One Road initiative from, from China. There's a lot of criticism of the terms under which the Chinese lend. But there is really no coherent vision from the West, whether from the EU or the US, which would which would offer support on a similar scale. And this isn't to say that the answers to these questions are easy. They're not. But we don't even see, I think, on the Western side, the ambition to formulate um, a coherent a coherent answer. What do you think accounts for that lack of ambition? I think on the one hand, um, the fact that the West is distracted, it has a whole bunch of problems of its own. Um, I think it's also frustration um, and disappointment. There have been moments um, you know, in the history of the last, well, the period since 1945 in which the West had ambition. And notably in, in, you know, in the region and most dramatically, of course, in Afghanistan, there is the experience of having poured quite a lot of money. Now, of course, much of the money went to the military and much of it was spent inside the American military, or despite all of those qualifications, however, having poured a lot of money into the region and, and, and in, from the West's point of view, gotten precious little for it in terms of, you know, the anchoring of a legitimate and stable order that was in some way a good partner for the West. And so I think a combination of distraction, disappointment, and, and the inherent difficulty of doing this, right? It's not easy to see how you devise a development strategy for societies as complex and riven with conflict and contradictions and structural obstacles to growth as a place like Pakistan is. Um, and so inherent difficulty, disappointment, and distraction, I think, probably add up to the the formula, which which says that there really isn't, you know, the West sort of can talk a big game when it talks, you know, billions into trillions. When we talk about sustainable development goals, um, we can spell out, you know, there are countless efforts to spell out at this point the scale of the um, of the investment that's necessary to deal with the global climate crisis, but. When it comes to actually figuring out, okay, how and where we're going to lend and for what purposes, um, that that ambition rapidly evaporates, um, and um, in a case as complicated as Pakistan, um, all the more so. Could could U.S. China competition, for better or for worse, um, push Washington into the business of debt diplomacy and investment? There is no prospect, I think, of America as a public lender becoming a, a competitor with, with China. And that also has implications for debt diplomacy, because it's been a long time now since America has been a large scale public lender. I mean, America doesn't do that kind of concessional lending anymore, way anymore as its major aid and development tool. It, it's in the form of grants, right? This was a decision taken in the 2000s in the wake of the first wave of you know, um, debt restructuring for the lowest income countries. And so America as a, as a lender um, is, is really no longer a major player in this space. Um, where America can exercise influence is by way of the um, IMF and the World Bank, where it's a major shareholder and in fact is, you know, provides the chair of the, of the, of the World Bank. And the other critical area of debt diplomacy where America is very important is in the law courts. And I mean, if America uh, wants to exercise a constructive influence on sovereign debt restructuring, then it's a matter of um, legislation to, uh, to prevent various types of sabotage and blocking action in the legal procedures, um, which take place either in the courts largely, frankly, of, of, of New York or in London. And what is America's influence over the IMF and the World Bank, if you could break it down for, for our listeners? Well, it's the largest. It's the largest single shareholder in the IMF, and it, by convention with the Europeans, provides the head of the World Bank. Um, and at the IMF, it then has the, the a key deputy position as well, um, who is widely considered to be crucial for economic policy making. And so, and it has a veto, so nothing can happen in either organisation without American approval. That doesn't mean that America can always get its way. But that does mean that it can steer uh, effectively um, 
And uh, the concomitant of that is also, however, that Congress plays a very powerful role in in um, um, IMF politics. And, and Senator Cruz, in his very first term as a senator, in fact, set out to sabotage the uh, efforts of the Obama administration to use the IMF in that period as a as an effective tool of, of global governance. Um, so for better and worse, America exercises a very considerable influence over both organizations. We are in a more complex multipolar world now, so it's no longer, you know, essentially uh, America no longer dictates, but it has huge influence um, and it certainly has a veto uh, for better and for worse. I want to come back to China for a moment. And earlier we we discussed how Washington has failed to provide any alternative to the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, and the China-Pakistan economic corridor is often referred to as the pilot project of that initiative. Uh, but regardless of whether Washington has uh, offered an alternative, do you think the common criticisms of BRI and CPEC that come out of DC are fair? Are they exaggerated? Are they downplayed? How would you assess, how would you assess them? I think they're exaggerated. Um, I think they imply and impute to Beijing and to One Belt, One Road a coherence and a strategic intent, which is unrealistic. They don't seem like a plausible to me account of how this kind of uh, framework has emerged out of Beijing. And in detail, um, they're unpersuasive as well. Um, if you take notably the Sri Lankan example, this has been multiply debunked as an instance of aggressive Chinese debt diplomacy. Um, the, the fact of the matter is that China is an assertive creditor. And if you fall into default, um, you will face tough bargaining from the Chinese. But behind the scenes, the Chinese have in fact made very considerable concessions to the people they've lent to. And um, there's little, ev and, and when it came to, for instance, the um, debt service suspension initiative last year, um, no, sorry, when it came to the debt service suspension initiative in 2020, through which relief was provided to uh, a long list of low income borrowers, the Chinese signed up um, relatively cooperatively to that to that proposal. They then tried to exempt some of their some of their creditors from that proposal, but they were playing, I think, fairly conventional uh, ball. So I think the it's it's it would be naive to imagine that the Chinese do not have strategic intention. It would be naive to imagine that the Chinese can't connect the dots. But the idea somehow that this, you know, this program was a was a gigantic effort to take over the world by a form of strategic debt diplomacy just seems to me to to be um, well. It's part of the hawkish turn in in the global assessment of Chinese role in the world. It has specific origins. I mean the the. The, the Sri Lankan example that became the anchor of this entire narrative was, was put into the world, first of all, by Indian think tankers. And you can, you can see what their stake would be in this narrative. So I'm suspicious for a variety of different reasons, not because I'm blue-eyed about you know, Chinese ultimate intent, but because it just, um, it just doesn't, um, doesn't add up to me. And there's a, as somebody also trained in you know, the skeptical historiography of of, of European imperialism in the late 19th and early 20th century. I'm, 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 I'm skeptical about the idea that this could be articulated with quite the coherence that is often, is often implied. You mentioned that uh, Sri Lanka did become the poster child of, of this uh, belief that Chinese investment in the global south was nefarious. Uh, and I was actually just in Sri Lanka, and it's at the, the height of its fuel crisis. Uh, and uh, it, there were some really striking scenes. I mean, petrol lines that last hundreds of vehicles, people sleeping overnight in, in their cars. Uh, when it would rain, you can see all of the people jump from their motorbikes and to take cover in the rickshaws and uh, gas canisters uh, lined up for a quarter of a mile. Some of these scenes were shocking, and yet the resilience of the country was also uh, apparent, and, and, and life seemed to be going on going forward uh, with, with a large degree of normalcy, at least from the perception of an outsider looking in. Um, but I do want to ask you, uh, does Sri Lanka uh, offer um, uh, 
a forewarning for for uh, countries in the global south that may assume that either the United States or China has their back. Yes, I think that is an important warning. Um, I think the the important takeaway, and it goes back to the first point about, as it were, the lack of an order. I don't think the world is right now, as it were, afflicted with too many too aggressive ordering projects which are clashing with each other. The the over the the, the most important characterization is actually the lack of that kind of ambition and scale. And Sri Lanka is an instance of that, right? You might think that everyone would be scrambling to 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 take advantage of this situation, um, for better or worse. Uh, well, we have seen some initiatives from the Indians, who who naturally are deeply interested in what's going on there. Um, but um, in general, I think um, as you look around the world, um, no one should anticipate, um, you know, huge, large scale emergency efforts being mobilised in support, which is what makes. The reaction to the war in Ukraine also so fascinating, one has to say, right, is that around this issue, tens of billions of dollars have been have been mobilized in an extraordinary extent. Um, but um, but Sri Lanka is a completely different kettle of fish. And I, and I fear um, the worst in many other uh, countries which are which are very stressed right now. So when you listen to Adam Tooze, you get the sense that the global financial order is not quite as impactful in the global south as, as one might think. And even though countries like Pakistan are receiving uh, significant support from institutions such as the IMF, they're more on their own than we might think. Yes, and actually zooming in on the developing world itself, one of the things that Adam Tooze mentioned that I found quite interesting is that the system is really skewed towards wealthier countries. And also given all the concern that the U.S. has about China's development financing and the noise around debt diplomacy, when in fact policy and strategy that is coming from within the U.S. and the West is actually, as Adam Tu has pointed out, formulated on a very ad hoc basis and lacks a singular vision. Agreed. And as uh, someone from the outside, I really wanted to hear from someone who has firsthand insight into navigating this complexity on behalf of Pakistan's government. And so... We're joined by Harun Sharif, who served as the Minister of State and Chairman of Pakistan's Board of Investment from 2018 to 2019. And I think you'll see that he thinks that the imposition of policies uh, by institutions such as the IMF actually removed creativity from Pakistan's policymakers, and for that reason led to outcomes that were less than ideal. So I'd like to ask you a question that's specific to Imran Khan's government. Uh, which spoke a lot about a geoeconomic reset with the world, particularly Western countries and uh, especially the United States. Uh, and the idea was to move away from a security-based transactional relationship towards one that was more rooted in investment. Uh, but this geoeconomic reset often fell on deaf ears in Washington. Uh, I, I, I think it's safe to say that a lot of folks in Washington rolled their eyes at it. Why do you think that is, and and why do you think Prime Minister Imran Khan wasn't able to uh, effectuate that reset? Well, I'm glad you asked this question. I am responsible for giving two words to the Prime Minister when I was part of his cabinet economic team. Uh, The first word was, I requested him, and he did that, uh, that you need to tell people that wealth creation and making money is a good thing. Because there's a mindset which actually in Pakistan uh, uh, was working against it. And he did it very well, I must say. Second was that I told the then foreign minister, Shah Mahmood Qureshi, that you know, your entry point for diplomacy should be geoeconomics, not necessarily uh, a geostrategic or security-led dialogues. So they both picked it up very well. So Prime Minister and I visited almost five countries in the first year, and he very well opened up space for this, you know, geoeconomics and partnerships, and people welcomed it. The sporting structures in foreign office was still led by this whole old school thinking of geostrategic, geopolitical, security-led lenses. I give example, a relationship with Saudi Arabia, You know, Prince Mohammed bin Salman promised me that, you know, and he announced in Pakistan uh, uh, over a $20 billion investment package. 
But the people who were supposed to follow up and deal with it, they were still stuck with Saudi Arabia relation, which was linked with security and Yemen and, you know, uh, concessional money from Saudi Arabia. And that's where our ambassadors and our, you know, civil servants failed me, frankly speaking, in having materialized those transactions. Uh, third thing, which I said in the very beginning, uh, we really don't know that economic diplomacy is not only the name of a dialogue. It is a very specific uh, economic transactions you sell. And that part, uh, uh, our capacity in government is not there. So my advice to people is that we use more private sector uh, led dialogues in economic diplomacy rather than using uh, traditional civil service. But you need to put in systems, uh, you know, if we want economic diplomacy relationship, then we, we must pick up, you know, five top most destinations for that. And the first test would be that who do you appoint there as invest, uh, ambassadors? And those ambassadors should be trained uh, to understand our economic situation and to basically offer uh, very specific transactions around that a dialogue could be structured. i give you an example of Afghanistan, for instance. In Afghanistan, uh, you know, if you keep on giving them, you know, let's talk about opening up your trade and, you know, facilitation, uh, people take it lukewarm. But if I tell them that, guys, I am arranging $100 million of investment to add value to your few fruits and vegetables, which you sell to the country, and here is an economic zone, let's sit together and talk about how can we build it. Suddenly, the joint interest in, you know, uh, profitability will come up and people will have a stake in it. Uh, that is where I think countries are faltering because we still are instrument to engage uh, remains just talk, not a concrete proposition. And for that, we need to invest a lot in training our people uh, who can offer those things. I can assure you there's a lot of liquidity I have huge list of missed opportunities of Pakistan just for this specific reason uh, that our teams did not know how to convert this discussion into transactions. Pakistan has had 21 programs with the IMF since 1958. And while the fund may have helped maintain a semblance of macroeconomic stability, the IMF's involvement along with the World Bank and others has surely not helped Pakistan break out of a low growth trap. Uh, and you've mentioned that these programs are about lenders, it's not real investment. Uh, so what do you think are the main reasons for this? Well, we need to be very clear that IMF is the lender of last resort. They are not a development financing institution. So we need to treat them as you know uh, somebody who comes and helps you out in crisis. Uh, multilaterals over the years, like World Bank and Asian Development Bank, I've been part of those at the very high board level as well and the staff, senior staff level as well. Uh, I would be very honest uh, that they have not invested in their knowledge of development, but they are driven by disbursements. And that has damaged, you know, their reputation. Frankly speaking, people don't like them, but since they offer cheaper money, so, you know, people are attracted to these institutions and they are becoming obsolete. They have not invested in modernizing their structures. Uh, they do good analytical pieces, but those pieces are never translated into their lending operations. That's for their internal knowledge. Uh, it's time that Pakistan diversifies its financing and goes to Asian markets uh, through bonds and investments uh, and reduces our reliance on these longer term concessional loans, particularly the what we call policy lending. We need these loans for building infrastructure like dams and roads and hospitals and universities perhaps, but not necessarily uh, uh, for improving reforms in public policy because the ownership of uh, reform does not come from conditionalities. The ownership comes basically through consensus within the political system and people of Pakistan and stakeholders. 
and that is basically uh, the main reason why pakistan has not owned reform but it because it has been dictated by multilaterals the biggest thing which has happened to pakistani government uh, structure uh, is that we ended up outsourcing our policy thinking uh, to donors and multilateral organizations because we were heavily taking money from them so it was very convenient for bureaucrats to buy in standard solutions they gave and that has damaged our policy making in a huge way i have been you know uh, one of the senior officials in the world bank and others uh, and i have seen that how these institutions have captured the policy space and really shifted priorities uh so pakistani that has eroded the capacity of bureaucracy to assess you know where we should be investing where we should be promoting we have blindly followed the do- donor recipes so i think you've just mentioned uh what investment in pakistan should achieve uh but i want to ask what specific industries uh should pakistan and international investors interested in pakistan focus on so if i would highlight four areas where pakistan in the medium to longer term uh, uh, can offer very good returns but also can help itself so one is because you know our 50 60% of exports are textiles but we need to get more into value added textile the stitched clothes and garments and fashion you know uh, we we have the value chains Uh, uh, which can deliver that second area is uh, uh, agro based uh, uh, food we produce lots of you know milk we produce lots of uh, cotton we produce lots of you know rice so we we don't and fruits and vegetables we don't convert it into anything we don't even make decent you know cheese or chocolates here so i think that is another area being an agriculture country and the pressures globally i'm seeing on food security particularly in the regions pakistan offers great potential third is information technology that's where us comes in because pakistan is perhaps at a stage where india was some 25 years back we produce 30000 graduates of it every years out of those about 5 to 10000 are quality graduates which can offer services Uh, to you know global market that needs to be leveraged basically and lots of companies can have their you know uh, 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 back offices here and designing and development of it services so we have a young english speaking uh, uh, it force uh, which could convert into knowledge exports and can earn us a lot more revenue it has three times increased by the way in five years but it it has a potential of going up to you know 10 15 billion dollars in no time if some investment is made so that's the third area which i highlight and the other areas which pakistan and china specifically spoke are linked to uh, you know light light engineering pharmaceuticals and you know leather uh, 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 kind of things which you know uh, we can offer a lot of potential we produce the you know all the world cup football soccer balls and things so we are pretty good in leather goods and sports goods and surgical goods and you can really you know multiply that so these will be four areas which resonate to my overall with the fault line i said we need exports we need dignified jobs for the young people and we need more revenue to meet our expenditures Do you think Pakistan can learn anything from the example of Bangladesh? Uh, you mentioned produce. Bangladesh is the world's third largest grower of vegetables. I think the annual production is 19.7 million tons. Uh and as a pre-COVID point of comparison, the US imported 6.7 billion dollars worth of goods from Bangladesh whereas it imported 3.9 billion dollars uh from Pakistan. Uh so So what explains this kind of disparity and and what can Pakistan learn from the example of Bangladesh I think Bangladesh has done wonderful particularly in the textiles and apparel high end 
you know, middle to high end industry. And in fact, they don't even have the production of cotton the way we have. And I admire Bangladesh's focus because they desperately needed exports. The country, three quarter of the country uh, is not necessarily available in terms of land because there's water there. Uh, so they have developed the human resources, particularly female labor force, and used it very actively to export their textiles. Uh, uh, Bangladesh got an edge as well, being the least developed countries, they had access, you know, cheaper ex access to export markets. Now they have become middle income country, so that access is gone, but they have developed enough competitive, you know, exportable surpluses. So you are absolutely right that Pakistan needs to go on sustainable competitive uh, uh, industry like Bangladesh, like Vietnam, like Cambodia. Uh, you know, that is where our competition in Asia is. Uh, the problem is that, you know, uh, 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 there are lots of uh, companies and sectors growing on state protection. Uh, and there are trade-offs. And that's where political economy comes in. Pakistan has struggled basically to deal with these, uh, I would say, crony networks and vested interests by, uh, uh, you know, changing the focus of investments into these productive sectors, which have longer term sustainability and growth potential in Pakistan. So I'd like to shift gears and talk about the IMF for a moment. What are the structural impediments in Pakistan that hinder impact based investments from the United States? and the multilateral institution, institutions such as the World Bank and IMF? Well, first of all, let's be very clear that these multilateral institutions don't make investments, they are lenders. So lender, you need to differentiate between investment and financing. Uh, so in terms of Pakistan's you know, story of going to IMF, that's very straightforward. We live beyond our means. So we have twin deficits. One is our budget deficit which grows up to 7% of the GDP, uh, uh, which is unsustainable because our revenues are low and our expenditures are high. Second is our more serious is external account because our exports and remittances combined uh, make half of our import bill. So somebody has to finance the rest. And that's where we go to multilateral and other borrowing time and again. And economy structure is such that whenever we have touched very good growth, say over 6%, but that's driven by trading and services. So that export, that growth does not generate enough dollars for us. And we end up going every five years to the IMF. So we know uh, very clearly the reasons. The issue is that how you change the structure of economy. It is the structural issue in economy and which is not the job of IMF or the World Bank. It is the job of Pakistan, actually, to change the structure, as I said, to productive sectors, which will not only yield foreign exchange, but also, you know, bring jobs and productivity and innovation in the economy. So that's a general comment why Pakistan time and again end up going and we have failed to implement reforms that will change the structure of economy. Now, investors in Pakistan, we have hopelessly low investment to GDP ratio, which is less than 15% of GDP. Our competitors basically have above 25 and up to 30% of GDP investments in their countries. So if we need to give you know, a, a sustained growth and jobs to people, we need to grow around 7 to 8% for 10 years. And for that, we need to almost double our investment to GDP ratio. Why private investment is shy of coming to Pakistan? Three reasons. Uh, number one is uh, uh, we need to have world-class policies and show consistency of policy. Because of the political instability, policies have been shifting very rapidly and investors don't like it. Second part is judicial system because when investors come, they do need, you know, an efficient system of dispute resolution. Uh, we don't have it as compared to our competitors or people going. And thirdly, it is the state institution's capability is very low to structure and understand investment transactions. Our ambassadors, our, you know, uh, officials in ministries, uh, we need to bring in the right managerial capabilities of bankers and engineers and lawyers 
who can structure transactions so that you know investors get a confidence different countries have tried different models i am an advocate of a model like uae or qatar or now kazakhstan where they have set up dubai international financial center where the law of the land does not apply in that building and it's a corporate economic zone where you register so your financing and property rights and disputes and facilitation needs are all clubbed in uh, into one uh, zone and that is where uh, you know investors feel comfortable so as you heard harun has some pretty strong opinions about the imf He also has strong opinions about the detrimental role that individual interests and patronage networks have on Pakistan's global market competitiveness. Next, we're going to talk to someone who has been able to compete quite well in the global marketplace through the export of textiles. Musaddiq Zulkarnain is someone who has really been in the trenches of those trade relations. He is the chairman and CEO of Interloop Limited and Interloop Holdings. Interloop is currently the largest listed textile company on the Pakistan Stock Exchange by market capitalization with about over 24,000 employees. I wanted to get something out of the way which might be a silly question but I'm genuinely curious what is the likelihood that I've worn a pair of socks produced by Interloop in my lifetime? 1 in 20. 1 in 20. Uh and so that's your share. So that's your share <laughs> of the market. That's our share in the market in the world. Okay, well, that is actually quite impressive. Um, and and it is. It is. Given the rate I But lose, do you, do you do you wear ever a Nike socks? Yeah, I have. So one third of the Nike socks come from us. Well, given the rate at which I lose socks and replace them, I'm sure I've worn. I'm sure I've worn multiple pairs of Interloop socks. um absolutely but you know that is an incredible scale so you're not your 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 business is not a small venture uh yeah i think it's from from that perspective it is and while we are you see expanding into other uh, textile categories now uh but uh, with socks out of pakistan we are already the second largest exporter from pakistan to all over the world so considering that it's just a tiny part of your entire uh, you see uh, attire it, it is it is incredible i i could have never thought he would have reached this stage but it's and it's continuously growing it's still growing i think pakistan deserves a preferential trade agreement for no other reason than it produces the best mangoes in the world but what kind of preferential free trade agreement with the us if any would be most beneficial for pakistan and i say that with a big uh caveat which is that uh, you know preferential trade agreements are not always economically beneficial so uh, adam uh, let me be very very candid uh, uh i don't i don't want to you see dream for things which uh, are either not possible or very difficult why would why would my 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 question to myself would be why would us give us a preferential uh, trade agreement there has to be some reason there has to be as you said if not economical there has to be some some geopolitical uh reason for which they would do it and i think that time has passed uh, probably when the uh, afghan uh, conflict was going on that was the time when um i think us was also anxious but we were not able to really make use of that well let's talk about china for a moment because even though the united states is pakistan's largest export destination country china is still pakistan's uh, largest source of imports do you think a repositioning of economic ties with the us is required given how instrumental the us textile markets could be as an export destination for pakistan the the question is what are we importing from china um and so far the ft which china has helped china more than pakistan uh although exports from pakistan to china are growing but most of our uh, textile uh, exports and other things Uh, are dependent on imports from china on on various raw materials and i don't think usa would be to be honest replace that uh, we can uh, what we can do is we can uh, probably change the rules of origin and uh, maybe us corporations us uh, producers can have some joint ventures in pakistan which can replace those and if that is tied up with a duty free access into us uh then that kind you see probably change the scenario 
but for for for, for the near future uh, i don't see uh, that shifting too much but having uh, about your question i think there's no doubt that we have to the the market is in the west and it is going to remain in the west because uh, while uh, uh, we have very good uh, relations with china uh, we'll always have to compete with the chinese low cost producers within china so um, for us the market will remain in the west uh, and we need to reposition ourselves in a manner and i would i would uh, adam i would my 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 personal uh, thinking is that it's more than economic it is the it is the uh, geopolitical positioning unfortunately the uh, situation is pakistan in pakistan is that for many things we are dependent uh, on uh, on us uh, starting from you see the the our exports our technology in, in for the defense and even even for 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 our you see for studies uh, 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 most of our youth they prefer to go to us to get their studies uh, and uh, and to study at the us uh, universities but uh, on the other hand uh, the political parties and at time the government just to you see um, obtain some sort of a uh, um, i would say a political benefit uh, whip up the sentiments in pakistan which are uh, somewhat anti us and they they know it it's 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 not really based on any facts uh, because in my view there, there are no permanent friends or foes on, on, in the international relations it has to be mutually beneficial relationships and i think while we our governments and our political parties wants to have good relations with the us they don't want to admit it they don't want to say it in the public and that has created a serious you see uh, disconnect between the general perception in pakistan and our policy um, i think that needs to be corrected well that's a very realist view uh, and i agree there's no permanent uh, friends or foes I, if i my own criticism of of US policy in Pakistan would be you know in comparison to the way China goes about it is that China is very good at doing a little bit uh and talking about it a lot and the United States actually uh will take significant measures to assist Pakistan and then not talk about it or talk about it in a way that's counterproductive I look at the what the united states has done so far is vaccinating pakistan for covid the tens of millions of doses and and yet it just doesn't get discussed very much and that's that's a failure of us diplomacy not not of pakistani gratitude uh so that's that's my commentary on my own country's approach to to, to development and and whether through aid or through investment um but i wanted to go back to uh the free trade agreement with china which you said has benefited china more than pakistan is that a commentary on free trade agreements in general or on the chinese approach to free trade agreements i think it has more to do with our own you see ability to be competitive as uh, you see the, the the free trade agreement with china is as far as the agreement is concerned i think it is it is quite good but the question is uh, apart from some of the agriculture products uh, are we competitive enough just having a fta won't help us get into the market uh, you need to be competitive um, so for example is without an fta bangladesh has much more uh, exports going into us than pakistan so i think uh, uh, pakistani companies were never geared up to export to china and now they are they are you see uh, uh, realizing that and most of our exports even today are are uh, uh, raw materials like yarns and those things uh, we need to get into the value added uh, you see segments and we need to invite chinese companies to invest in pakistan for to re-export into china as as i think with the, with the passage of time the chinese uh labor is going to get expensive and they'll have to move towards more high tech areas and the textiles is going to the apparel is going to become more expensive to produce in china so i think uh, that is where pakistan can take benefit of that but for that you, you, we have to have our own house put in order we can't just you see live on duty free excess and uh, you see, expect that the th- everything will be all right by doing that it's interesting you you mention uh that labor in china has increased and that's an opportunity for pakistan because 
I, I think I, I read a report by one of the big four audit firms uh, that argued, or it was an and it was an analysis, and, and their their conclusion was that the shift in production to Vietnam, which is often blamed on the U.S. trade war with China, was actually already happening before the trade war uh, as a result of rising labor costs in China, and this was kind of a natural transition. Um, you also mentioned Bangladesh, um, so. I, I can't help myself. I, I, I must ask your opinion. Why, when we look at pre-COVID points of comparison, why has the U.S. imported six point seven billion dollars worth of goods from Bangladesh, whereas uh, in in, in two thousand nineteen, whereas it only imported three point nine billion dollars worth of goods uh, from Pakistan? What explains this disparity? So I think that there there could be multiple reasons, but the main reason is that. Uh, uh, Bangladesh has been uh, has become more efficient. They have used uh, uh, when they realized that for them uh, the uh, ready made garments is the lifeline. Uh, they the government and I think the businesses over there they wholeheartedly you see invested in that area and they have developed a situation where uh, they are. Labor is much more efficient. The government is much more supportive uh, because that is the only business they have. They don't have any other vested interests like, like in Pakistan, we have lot of other vested groups which you see have to have the piece of the cake here. Uh, so that has made the Bangladesh uh, uh, garment industry much more uh, productive. Okay, so I see Mossadegh's point of attracting more direct investment into the country, and how he said that there's no longer a very concrete geopolitical reason for the U.S. to to establish any preferential trade agreements with Pakistan. So to me, it does make sense that if you're actively part of the export business, uh, business like Mossadegh, then you see the future of U.S. public relations as very much grounded within the private sector. Exactly, and look, we heard Harun Sharif assert. That the IMF and the World Bank aren't investors; they're lenders, and it's critical that Pakistan view them as such. If you want to have these preferential trade agreements, so you want to have private sector uh, investment, you're going to have to create the conditions that attract those kinds of agreements and that kind of investment, and that's up to Pakistan. And on that note, I'd like to introduce someone who is investing in Pakistan as our final guest for today. That's Kalsum Lakhani, who is the co-founder and general partner at Invest to Innovate Ventures. That's I to I for short, an early stage venture capital fund for Pakistan and the country's first female founded VC fund. Let's get right into it. Uh, you're involved in early stage venture capital with a focus on Pakistan. And uh, how much of total funding, and what I mean by that is venture capital funding for startups, has come from U.S.-based firms, and how does strengthening of the bilateral economic ties between the two countries impact uh, the venture capital landscape uh, in Pakistan? Um, sure. So I don't have um, the exact breakdown of U.S. versus European-based firms or angels, but last year in 2021, startups in Pakistan raised about $350 million in funding. And about 40% of that amount came from international venture capital funds. So um, most of those were in either the Middle East, Europe, or the U.S. Um, so it kind of gives you a sense of all the money that's flowing into the country um, or was flowing into the country in 2021 prior to, obviously, a lot of the economic turmoil that we're facing right now globally. Is that an impressive number in your view? Yes, it is. I mean, so it's not impressive if you're comparing it to more developed markets. But if you look at Pakistan from 2019, 2020, and then 2021, to give you a sense of things, in 2019, startups raised about $49 million in funding. In 2020, it was $65 million in funding. And then in 2021, it was $350 million, so about 5.5x of what we saw before. Um, whereas before, we were seeing a, a steady increase um, the last few years, but it wasn't very it was very minuscule comparatively. Um, and now, obviously, we were seeing companies raise like significantly larger rounds of capital, which is something that was not um, unlike what was happening in other untapped emerging markets, especially because a lot of international VC funds had a lot of liquidity and wanted to put it in new places. And Pakistan is one of those last untapped uh, emerging markets. 
Yeah, and I mean, it, it must be intimidating to enter a market where it's it is it the perception is this is you got to know a guy kind of environment. I think so. I mean, I've been in this market for like over a decade. And so you can, I just think it's, it's an extremely relational market. And so I think for people coming outside in, it can feel very intimidating for the first time because it really is like every guy will tell you that he knows a guy and then you have to really figure out for yourself who's for real, who's not, who's BS. Um, so I think it's, I think having, it's also why, I mean, I believe that box on focus funds or funds like us that have been operating here and know the space become really important partners, not just for people putting their money into funds, but also for outside funds looking in. And we, that's why we work so closely with a lot of international VCs um, because they are not, and especially during 2021, they were not coming and doing diligence in Pakistan on the ground, right? Everything was done over Zoom. Um, and so you can't do diligence that way for a lot of these operationally intense, intensive businesses. So so having funds that you partner with or trust on the ground becomes vitally important. And then also when a startup is building, you need to have local connections to help get things done, which is also what um, local funds, um, you know, can be helpful with. Um, and so, yeah, I think those are some of the, the considerations. But yeah, it's hard. If you had, let's say, two minutes to sit down with uh, very senior Pakistani policymakers and I'm sure you probably already do sit down with them, but uh, but you have just two minutes and you need to give them very practical, actionable steps that they could take to increase investment into the country within the next two years. What would you tell them? I mean, I would say that, you know, having a proper cohesive um, policy regime for the startup ecosystem is something that's really important. Oftentimes you'll have like 50 different moving parts or some people are doing something and there's like some PM group, prime minister group that's meeting about startups, but then they're not talking to this other group that's meeting about startups. And we're just constantly getting, you know, giving feedback without like it being heard. So for me, the first thing that I would say is to like build a cohesive policy framework of what needs to change and happen. There's still a lot of regulations that need to be, even though we've made steps in the right direction towards, you know, as an example, the holding company legislation to allow startups to set up um, holding companies abroad. That way, a lot of investors don't have to worry about putting their money directly inside the country, um, played a massive role in why it unlocked so much capital in 2021. Um, but there's still a lot of um, opaqueness around the laws itself and how they actually get are executed. And so there's still a lot of work to be done. I think I would say also to improve a lot of the things around the private funds legislation, how money flows in and out of the country. Um, and a lot of that has to do with, you know, a lot of those concerns are oftentimes not anything related to us. It's related to, um, you know, uh, the depreciation of the currency. It's related to IMF regulations. There's all these other things that are above us, but I would actually say like, what can we do in the spaces that we have to continue to encourage innovation in the market? I would say that the taxation regime is one of the most onerous regimes. And we've now had increasing more taxes on different industries that are impacting everyone right now, whatever, wherever you are. Um, and so I would say that while those might be necessary for, um, for the IMF package, maybe in the short term, really thinking in the medium term, how do you continue to create tax breaks um, for startups? Right now, everything is so onerous and what it's doing is not actually making people pay the taxes. We're actually just encouraging more cultures of double books and triple books, um, which obviously criminalizes people because they want to keep the lights on of their businesses, right? And so all of these things I think are really important. And oftentimes you'll have the Securities and Exchange Commission and the State Bank and Pakistan in a room, but you won't have the tax regime in the room. And so while it's great to have some of these changes, unless a lot of the reasons behind why people don't go online as an example, or don't want to be transparent about things is because they're afraid of the tax net. And so um, not having that is like an elephant in the room. And I think I would really recommend in that cohesive policy framework to make sure that we have um, a proper ta like improvements to the taxation regime overall. You know, I'm really glad that we got to talking about the startup sector in Pakistan and how amazing some of these funding numbers look, especially given the historical and current challenges within the Pakistani market. Yes. And as Musavik said earlier, American investors aren't going to channel money into Pakistan out of the goodness of their hearts. The conditions have to exist and they have to be made conducive to attracting that kind of investment.
So this is what makes it a very policy centric conversation, I think, and what can be done to deal with the many obstacles in the way of sustainability once the money does come in. And the reality is that Pakistan does have potential to be attractive to investors in the US as there is already interest and there's even follow through. And I think this really helps us to break away from the traditional donor recipient binary that we keep coming back to. Well, thanks for joining me today, Mariam, to listen to these guests from very different uh, backgrounds who all had uh, perceptive things to say about Pakistan's economic engagement with the United States uh, and the world in general. And of course, we could probably interview dozens more people, uh, but we're going to have to call it a day for now. The audit is produced by the Bad Lab Center for Regional and Global Connectivity. Episodes featuring Adam Weinstein are produced in collaboration with the Quincy Institute. Episode 1, Talking Money, featuring Adam Weinstein and Mariam Mirza, was edited by Kashif Nadim and produced by Sarah Khan. Additional production assistance from Sameh Noor and Mariam Mirza. Executive production by Shahab Siddiqui and Zishan Salahuddin. Music by Vibe Mountain. Please subscribe for future episodes.